Welcome to another episode of A Question of Meaning. Hiya, folks. We're Arthur and Katie, and glad you've tuned in. And, uh, wow, you see from the turtleneck, it's cold again. <laughs> Not again. Not again. We were really hoping for a little bit milder winter, but I'm sure everybody's been complaining, so and we've we'll lived move for on. 15 <laughs> years and at 3,600 feet, and we come down to Asheville. The operative is down to Asheville. <laughs> Last January, we moved in, and I've never seen anything like it in the 20 <laughs> years we've been in North Carolina. And here we are in mm. December, first week in December, and it's starting off with a, a bang, not a yeah. whimper. Uh, I'll give you a prediction. It's going to be cold, it's going to be gray, and it's going to last the rest of your life. Well, maybe this is why you had the idea. Groundhog Day. Oh, excuse me. Uh, maybe this is why you had the idea for the show that you did, which is boredom. Since that being like cabin fever, being stuck inside can easily lead to boredom. And I thought that was an interesting topic. Uh, so I like, the, I like the growing seasons, the green and the, even the splendor of fall. Mm -hmm. But this is like, uh, what's the history of white people in America? It says, uh, remember, son, death is just a part of life. It's the last part. Well, as far as I'm concerned, that's what winter is. It's just a, something to get through. Well, you were, you were raised I'm a Florida in the, boy. Yeah, in the I south. I like the tropics. I was raised in the north, and I like winter. I mean, there's, when, you know, it's fun. I like being feeling cool um, mm, on my face cool. when I go outside, and it, it makes me feel invigorated. And, you know, I love to go a nice to ever drive by that's like a ski slope that we can't get out of the house for well, that's six a different, days. That's a different matter. And counting. That's a different matter. And that's just because we're being wimps. I mean, we could get out if we wanted to. Yeah. If you want to survive, you could do what the Andy survivors did. I mean, you know. We could... Okay. Can we get on? A... So maybe you can say maybe there's some. A question meaning, cat. Can I serve you tonight? Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe there's some boredom here already. So maybe that's what motivated. Well, so yeah. what was the, why, why were you motivated to think of using, of having boredom as the topic? Because yeah, I don't think we've talked about boredom and I, in my own philosophy, even though I suffer from boredom on a regular basis, I even said Katie was boring. Mm -hmm. I found Memorable. Katie boring in a show not long ago. I'm sure you don't feel that way about me ever, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't say it on the air. That there was my go. only problem was you said it publicly. <laughs> That's right, typical female. You know, it's kind of like in the Dixieland back during the good old days of de facto segregation or de facto slavery, really. It was that um, the South was uh, no, up until flagrant that point. about being bigoted. You know, the rest of the country was looking down their noses, and then it turned out they were all hypocrites. No, was, are you in suggesting East St. Louis, this is Fillmore a, District? Are you Watts? suggesting this is a sexist thing? Because all, all I was saying is that prior to that, mentioning you, you saying that you found me boring we really hadn't been honest and about ourselves at the at that level True. so that i think that was really more what i meant about not saying it publicly that's right. i hate you <laughs> that's right we we're trying to no that's your cue oh, i hate you too that's right <laughs> okay, if you can't say that what kind of relationship have you got so anyway back to why you thought boredom was a good subject no i think i lost my train of thought. I think I've lost my text. I'll well, say this, that I can remember in the third grade, I'm almost sure it was the first time I ever experienced boredom or felt boredom. I don't know if you can experience boredom. I think it's a <laughs> mental, interesting, yeah, a mental creation. Right. And it was horrible. It was excruciatingly painful. It was like my whole body was aching. I was like suffering with this feeling of having nothing to do hmm. and not, you know, just not a I mean, nothing to do. It was, I wasn't inspired to do anything. I just felt bored for the first time in my life. And of course, it's a complete symptom of insanity. Right. Because observably, we live in a completely dynamic universe. It is always changing. It is never the same. It is always fresh. And I think that's basically what the message of boredom is, is him being here, me, and I've seen you. Mm -hmm. been you. you know, right. just like, you know, I've seen it on TV several times. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, Generation X lacks, you know, non reactive, like, hey, what's up? How are you? <laughs> One step from death. I was like, no wonder they like zombie movies. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. That's Shocked funny. <laughs> I'm so hip. You know, just like seen it all, done it all. 
<laughs> that's like the model of, of what it is to be sophisticated. That's right. Be zombie. Hey, kids, when's the last time you ever had a cocaine orgy, huh? <laughs> talk about your many experiences in that department. Okay, so. Watch snow banners on Mount Everest. Uh, what else have you seen on TV lately? Well, so once somebody actually said that to you, that they thought maybe one of the reasons you were bored with your life was because you'd, you'd had adventures of the kinds you just mentioned. And yeah. so it was easy for you to feel bored with just ordinary reality. Yeah, unfortunately, the I problem mean, with that saying, argument is yeah. that, you know, the, as I said, the whole universe is the, the what do we say in our book? The, we talk about survival. What survival is, we define survival as the effort of a form to maintain its existence, structural integrity. Everything is trying, every physical form in the universe, every form in the universe is trying to stay unchanged through time. In the physical realm, that's completely impossible. Because in the physical realm, any physical form changes across any two consecutive measurable units of time. It's always different. And the chances of being reconnected, and, and survival resists change because it correctly equates change with death. Once you change, you're no longer what you were. That instant ago, the person that is going to end this sentence is dead as the person who began it. And the chances of me ever being that person who started the sentence again, exactly as I was in, is zero. Nothing is ever the same. So just for starters, boredom is a complete freaking lie. Right. Because what, is, what does boredom say? If not, I'm, I'm bored with life. There's nothing new. There's nothing new. Yeah, right. Isn't, isn't that what it's saying? I mean, what else right. could it be? You should right. go look up a dictionary. You should have well, a dictionary in here for yeah, moments like this. Yeah, that would like be good. This. Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, Google. There's a computer right there. But, yeah. So, well, I think boredom, you know, there's kind of two different sides of it. You find someone or something boring because it's like you've seen it all before. There's nothing new there. And uh, then you're bored when you feel like you have nothing of interest to do. It's kind of a futuristic thing. I mean, there's nothing to look forward to. Right. You don't foresee anything in your future. Right. So, y- yeah. So, you know, you, you when you're bored, that means there's nothing around you that has enough interest in it to, you know, bring you up out of that state of lethargy, of lack of interest. And it's a painful thing. Yeah. Sort of so, you know, so it's, it's like, you know, they're both of them saying that there's nothing new in, and of interest in reality, but they're just, there's kind of a slight difference. So when hmm, you call. I just got something. Okay, go ahead. Well, I just got that. We talk about um, being our book, We Are All Innocent by Reason of Insanity, posits that. Basically, the mind is programmed by the time we're still in diapers. You've already decided whether you're going to play life as a winner or a loser. And that you, essentially, we become machines. We have an outlook, a way of playing the game of life. And that theme is written, chiseled in stone. And our behavior for the rest of our lives is uh, improvisions on that theme, on that fixed theme. We're always going to be that way. Mm-hmm. So... Oh, shit, I lost it. It was like... Um, well, isn't that why we were, we feel bored? Because we're living out the same role, the yeah. same person over and over and over again every day. We think we don't change from day to day. And so we find life boring because... What, could, what do we have to look forward to? We're going to wake up tomorrow and still be us. I'm going to be brushing my teeth again. I'm so bored with brushing my teeth. Putting your pants on the same leg at a time. That's right. Left, left step, right step. That's right. It seems like it's exactly the same over and over and over again. And um, it's like ha- very, Day that's right. Again. That's right. It's very hard to see how things are different. And, you know, in a relationship, um, particularly when you've been with someone as long as we have 30 years, uh, you basically know every story. Arthur's daughter, she would always get really excited when we would one of us would tell something that the other person didn't know. It was like a moment to celebrate mm-hmm. because those moments were so rare. Say, See, there's something you didn't know about the other. That's you right, know. and that's why it feels like you're you're bored with them because it's like you've been able to put them in a box a long time ago. I know who they are. They're never going to change. I know what they did. They never it's will change, and so. You know, I, I don't even have to pay attention to them anymore. 
They're, they're just old news. And so that's easy to get bored because, you know, why even look in his direction? You know, that's going to be a problem. Like, <laughs> you know, you button our shirts wrong. We wouldn't know to tell the other person because we don't even look at them anymore. <laughs> go to the movies or something, go into the men's room and look, and I've got a huge chunk of spinach in my teeth that's been there for like that's out right. since lunch. <laughs> <laughs> like and we said on an earlier show, love is letting the other person know about the spinach. Well, the boredom means you don't even pay attention enough to see it. So that's um, certainly... It's not what I thought, not what I was thinking, but I can't remember. Uh, maybe it'll come back. Oh, I but didn't was, think was I was saying one. what you were thinking. No, no, no. I'm, I, I, uh, but, that. you know, frankly, I thought when you said you found me boring, um, what I thought it was more than just that you'd seen me before, that, you know, you have know all my stories, and that there's kind of a way I think sometimes that you find, find boring. Because when I listen to that show again, um, what I thought you were saying was, Sometimes I'll kind of like I'll have read something and I'll kind of go off on a uh, exposi exposition. Is that the right word? You know, like I'll start talking about it and maybe sometimes talk like I know what I'm talking about when I really don't. I'm just sort of parroting off somebody else's line of thought and, and I, that you find that kind of a boring way of thinking on my part. That yeah, you find maybe it's a little, like not really creative. I'm not. There's nothing creative coming out good. of me. I'd say that's exactly true. Based on that show, that's what I think you were doing. I think you were kind of winging it. I was. Polite I mean, I was just sort of bullshit. Yeah, it was. A, it was like I didn't know what <laughs> uh, we were talking about time, and we were getting toward the end, time and I didn't really have anything to say. So it was like something that I just I had read recently, and and so you know that when when I heard it later, I was like, well, you know, maybe he was right to tell me to shut up, <laughs> and that's how he did it was to say, I think you're boring. <laughs> But it was like it was a boring way of thinking on my part, which was n an uncreative way of thinking. Well, boring is always unconscious. Yeah. Boring is always an indication of insanity. And since we're all insane, what do you expect? Right. I mean, it's going to be a regular feature of life. And how do we deal? How do we cope with boredom? Maybe that's what I was trying to say was that our, we posit mm. that we're all insane. Right. We all confuse our mind-generated reality with actual reality. We, a chapter of our new book is about why time goes faster. You know why time goes faster the older you get? It's because we're not experiencing anymore. We're bored with seeing the same thing, so we don't have to really pay attention to it. We can brush our teeth while thinking about, you know, what kind of show we're going to do next week. Mm -hmm. We can... Um, not really. I mean, rarely does the mind even shut up. We're always thinking and planning and yummy, 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 or reading or doing some busy work as a way to cope with maybe just a sense of like general boredom. And, and the point is that in, ter in terms of time going faster, we're not even around to experience linear moments of time, of present now. We're somewhere else. We're not in the here and now. We're there then. And when we were children, we were here now a lot more in the present. And we were experiencing every fresh moment of time, which is reality. But the way the mind gets programmed is that it basically says everything is like everything. Or, uh, you know, everything is like everything. I've seen it. I've done it. I've been there. I don't have to give my full attention to that. Hi, how are you? Fine. Good. Oh, I just was diagnosed with brain cancer. How are you? <laughs> oh, good. Great. Thanks. I'm fine. You know, this is a recording. So we don't have to be in the present. We're, we're in our heads. We're thinking about other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we're not even aware of those linear moments of time, which go whoosh, 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 unexperienced, flashing by. So maybe all this busy work, maybe pouring beer down your neck or doing drugs or just doing all sorts of busy work, taking the brats. To, oh, there's a documentary we've got to see about how people, like, try to, you know, plan their children's future to the to the max just read about it on the new york times helicopter parents is that what it's called i don't know I don't that's what that, that's the phrase for it people that are hovering over their children all the time oh yeah i mean mountains of homework yeah soccer games extracurricular activities for credit on your future record so you can get into yale <laughs> just nightmare scenarios it's really an underground hit Okay. That's not what it's called, but it's um, well, anyway. So the idea is we just fill up our lives with all this busy stuff mm -hmm. because maybe the underlying reason is we're bored 
witless, to put it politely, before hmm. 11. Well, you know, it's a I, way of coping with was... excruciatingly painful boredom. <laughs> Maybe we're all bored to death with it. Bored of Democrats, bored of Republicans, hmm. bored of television. How could you not be bored with TV? <laughs> you know, Channel 20 accepted. <laughs> Um, yeah, actually, I was thinking of this before you quite got to this point. So it's interesting because you really were going to where what I thought of, which was what the a word. Day. We still have a little life. That's right. In the relationship. Um, the word pastime. That you know when uh, you do something for pleasure, we call it a pastime. And you know when when you look at what that word means, it's to pass the time. That you're doing these things just to get time over with. And so that definitely fits in with what you were just saying. Remember the that... scene in, in uh, Groundhog Day again? Yeah. Where he's throwing the cards in the hat, and she says, this, "That's what you do with eternity." <laughs> well, I was because I've just taught myself to crochet, which I'm enjoying learning how to do. And I was going to describe it to somebody, and the word pastime, my, a new favorite pastime, was crocheting while listening to bo- podcasts. And I thought pastime that's you know and i had this this thought about what that means and, and i don't want to use that word anymore because it's not really i don't want to th- and i i thought of this years and years ago when i was in high school you know or maybe it was even grade school and people would we get close to the end of the school year and people would make a calendar a countdown to the last day of school you know depending on how badly you hated school would be how high the number would start it's funny my countdown started the first day of school <laughs> See, exactly but you know let's just say it started at 100 so every day you know you're crossing off the day or on a calendar on the wall you cross the day off when you finished it and it occurred to me that this was like being happy about crossing another day of your existence off that you're pleased to have gotten through another horrible day of life and I thought what an awful way of looking at your life that is a way of like that you're bored all the time and all you want to do is get through it and I don't want to I don't want to spend my life (laughs) happy getting through it I want to spend my life happy in it I'm thinking of Squire Western and uh, Tom Jones when they uh, uh, Tom Jones mother is buried and Squire Western slaps his head on his after the <laughs> ceremony second as ever he slaps his head on his head and says, Ah, there's another one gone. <laughs> Come on, it's time for time for Din Din. <laughs> <laughs> right, but I mean that how much regret at the end of life is because <laughs> you spent so much of your time just passing, you know, past in past times and getting through it and getting past things as fast as possible. You know what came up for me was um I would never consi- consider one of my um, psychotropic experiences, mm-hmm. life-changing medication that's illegal all over the world. <laughs> I would never consider that a pastime. It just came right. to me. This mm-hmm. it was like an example of what wouldn't I consider a pastime? Mm-hmm. Making love. Right. Uh, not necessarily making love, but hot sex. Um, <laughs> um, the work. Right. Working on this stuff, trying to figure out what the hell we're doing here and who are we and what's going on. Right, when you're Duh. passionately involved in yeah. a work that means mm-hmm. something to you. But uh-huh. also, my, particularly my psychotropic experiences. Right. I, would, I even would refer to it as like a, a vacation in paradise where I could spend eight hours just out of this world, out of this world of sameness and boredom. Hmm. I think this may, there may be something here. Uh-huh. I don't think... A, that boredom, I'm starting to see it as not necessarily a... Uh, a state that we go a, into yeah, sometimes, right. but it's like what, where we are all the time. It's, boredom? It's, you're soaking it I up. Know, I know. I, I kind of got that idea earlier. How's that, it's folks? fascinating. I mean, right. isn't life dull? Isn't <laughs> modern life dull? I mean, I know I'm a freak. But why but, do people watch TV? Yeah. Because they're bored. They want to escape. And they want to go dance with the stars. Yeah, I wish I could be that cute little Bristol pilot. Or you, like you say, you, you watch it, you go to the movies, mm-hmm. or you go drink beer. It's all Get about drunk kind every of, night, escaping, couple of just, uh, escaping from the boredom of your life. I'm not in that world anymore. I'm not boring me. <laughs> wow. God, Medications, know, uppers, downers, and betweeners. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Vacations to exotic mm-hmm. climbs, you know, to uh-huh. those people we saw when we went to the Grand Canyon that kind of, you know, we sat on a rock at one viewpoint. I mean, there oh, yeah. it is. I mean, what do you want? Right. But here they would come. You'd hear the cars going, slam, slam, go the doors, and you hear this, 
here come the feet, you know. <laughs> and they'd rush over right out of Chevy Chase, you know, on vacation. Like, mm, 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 mm. And then the feet would rush back, slam, slam, go the doors. <laughs> and then they'd take off to the next viewpoint, you know. I wrote a song called <laughs> Nothing's New because uh, I said you wanted a new song. Ask me to write one for you. You'd pretend when I sang it that you didn't know. Nothing's new. And that's in a, a real profound way, nothing's mm. new. What I'm talking about is once you decide that you're a loser or you're a winner, which is equally bullshit, shoot. Eh, give me a break. If your kids don't know the meaning of that by this point, you know, you better turn this TV off completely and, you know, okay, bury well, look, them in a cave somewhere. Some people do have. Wall them up in a cave. Bull poopy. Okay. It's bull poopy. <laughs> poo poo. Doo doo. Uh, okay. So. Bull number two. How about taro scatological? Right. You um, know, I was thinking about this, um, maybe to get back to what you're saying, because I'm not sure that either of us could quite recreate finished. what you were saying. So maybe this will remind you of what you were saying was that what the, the image that came to my mind was uh, I used to hike. To, when I would hike, I would go to a destination. For me, it was all about getting to a destination um, and to the the place that would be, you know, mind blowing or awe inspiring or you know, something that would take you out of the feeling of boredom. And uh, when we moved, first moved to North Carolina, we, we had built a house up on uh, up just south of Mars Hill and a little river. And uh, our cat that we had, not question meaning cat, this was this cat named Fluffles who loved being outdoors. And she and I would go on, on walks. And, and there was this wa- uh, path along the river that I uh, would walk on by myself. And so I just, when she would come with me, I think, well, we'll just walk down this path together, which we did a few times. And then one day she just started meowing and, and acting really upset um, and stopped in the path. And I turned back thinking, you know, maybe she'd fallen or hurt herself or something. And um, then she, when I walked towards her, she ran up the hillside off the path a little ways. And when I stood there and looked at her and she started meowing again, and when and I followed her, and then she scampered up the path, and I realized she wanted me to follow her, and not go on the human path, but to follow what a cat would do in the woods. So I I did I followed her, and I ended up we ended up walking about fifty feet maybe in the time it would have taken us to walk a quarter of a mile, but what we did was we would walk for ten feet, stop, and I would sit down, and she would sit down, and we I would just look. And then we'd sit there for 10 minutes, and then we'd walk another 10 feet, sit down. And the difference in the, of what I was seeing and what I was experiencing in the, that space of 10 feet was enormous. Crawling into rhododendrons. Right. And, and They got back. I'd been doing ecstasy. Well, we were oh, both oh, doing ecstasy. Oh, no, 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 no. Wasn't that that day when no. you came back to the door? No, that was a different oh, day. Oh, sorry. So, um, All runs together. You can tell that story after I finish this. But what I learned, though, was that I had always been going for the hike was the excuse or what you had to get through to get to some destination. And what I learned from Fluffles was that it was, I could be out in the woods. It would all be about being there and in the moment and experiencing where I was at. And for me, it completely changed the way I saw being in the woods. I no longer hiked as a, as a means of, of, to an end. There was no end. There was only the means. There was only the being. That's the way a kid would do it. Yeah. And you don't was, have destinations or goals. That's right. goal-oriented. So right. now your goal is to get into Yale by the time you're still in your pampers. <laughs> That's right. That's Apparently, or somebody's poor, goal. Poor children. I mean, it, children are <clears throat> it's harder and harder for kids to have the kind of childhood we had because they're not allowed to have that time of goallessness. Well, I want to talk about this other day. It was a yeah, really please. cold day, and we were doing ecstasy, and she went out with fluffles, and they came back, and they'd been doing one of these Fluffles didn't do ecstasy, but I did. <laughs> yeah, they're in the, under the rhododendrons and in the wilds, Fluffles in the lead. And they came in the door, and they looked positively. Fluffles looked like a bear. She looked like a mini. She was a long hair. Uh-huh. But her hair was just, it was like she had stepped in an electric socket or something. Her hair uh-huh. was just like sticking out. And they both looked just totally wild. Very dramatic. Yeah. Yeah. So boredom, boredom is a chronic condition. 
Right, that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. I think so. As a, a manifestation of insanity. How, mm-hmm. how could it not be? There's mm-hmm. nothing fresh. There's nothing new. Mm-hmm. It's just you trapped in you. Mm-hmm. Trapped in this perspective. I mean, I feel like what's inside me is still the girl I can remember in the elementary school schoolyard crying because the girl, you know, the other girls had, you know, left me out of the game that day. I mean, that seven-year-old girl is, you know, it's the same person. It's the same way of looking at the world. And if that's not boring, you know, 40-odd years of that mm-hmm. same... Well, it's gotten worse. <laughs> what I'm saying is that seven-year-old girl was still much more in the here and now, I suggest, than you are. <laughs> I would think that's or true. Or me. Yes, probably. And it takes something powerful, like this certain psychotropic substance that I experimented with very seriously for three years or so, that would interrupt what the source of the boredom is. What we used to call ego domination, and we now call it a particular part of the mind that is like elephantitis, that is swollen all out of proportion in a diseased form, Mm -hmm. an inevitable form of evolution, but unhealthy nonetheless, very detrimental to our happiness and to our love and to our sanity and to our peace. It's a subjective mind. It is the source of value judgments. By the time we're seven years old or eight years old or nine years old, it just gets worse and worse. We have a price tag on everything in reality. Everything we see, we evaluate mentally. Good, bad, better, worse, beautiful, ugly, boring, interesting. Everything is evaluated constantly. And what happened to me when I was 28 years old was I ingested the substance and it had the ability to suddenly um, suppress this evaluation system, the subjective mind, and left intact largely my objective mind that we think is the source of genius. I mean, great names, uh, great innovators in history, artists, uh, Michelangelo, uh, uh, da Vinci, um, Italians, Galileo, <laughs> um, uh, Newton, Einstein, are those who have managed to keep this conduit open to the objective mind, this enormous supercomputer that is awaiting our bidding if we can ever access it, but we can't because we're, we have these thick cataracts of subjective mind over our egos, which is just our point of view, our, our eyesight, our perspective of the universe, our unique individual perspective of, the, of what is. And it was the ability to suddenly have this subjective evaluation suppressed and allow me at the age of 28 to see for the first time in my adult life, because part of the incredible life-changing experience was I knew I'd been in this place before. I knew sometime in the distant past, and I now believe it was very early childhood, I had been able to see the objective universe, the reality around me, with eyes unencumbered by the cataracts of subjective opinion and belief. And what I saw was flawless perfection, was unmatched beauty in the dirt at my feet. And that's what's waiting for us. But when you have those cataracts on, all you see is your brilliant opinions about everything. And I don't care how many viewpoints you go to at the Grand Canyon. (laughs) You know, we've been to Bora Bora, you know, we've been to the to New Zealand. We were in New Zealand for a month. It's an incredibly beautiful place. And we had all sorts of fights, you know, the pivotal part of our relationship. Hera and I on the Great Barrier Reef. Almost got on the helicopter and left. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. You're... <laughs> oh, yeah, who's casting? <laughs> That's oh. right. Well, we, it was you mutual know, always. That's, so this is really interesting. So, uh, the, well, so you I know, think what I was thinking. Yeah, okay, okay, so you you brought up say Leonardo da Vinci, um, and it was interesting you, you saying that because I thought, all right, I mean, so would they? Would you say someone like him would have much less 
of an experience of boredom, or you know, you said maybe boredom is an experience, but that they and that maybe one and what I thought was that maybe one of the reasons the outpouring of work from some of these geniuses happens because they aren't bored. That part what part of what our, the boredom does is it just it's because when I when I have felt bored, um, what I feel is it's like kind of like a depression. It feels right. like it sucks energy out of you. It makes you makes me lethargic and not wanting to get up and do something. And it's kind of a self reinforcing um, feeling. And, uh, and so and, you know, people of, of genius are often people of enormous productivity, that they are just pumping out all sorts of ideas and, and, and inventions and, and theories, you know, whatever it is, the work that they do, and and you know that, and it just occurred to me that maybe it's that that lack of, you know, that the boredom is actually getting in the way of us being creative I'm beings. No kidding. But I would say I would hasten to say that I don't think that um, this the the fact that there's a pinhole open or a conduit open to people like Einstein. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, you know, I like the title of that book, and I never read it. Irving Stone, I think, The Agony and the Ecstasy about Michelangelo. Mm-hmm. It was agony. I yeah. don't think that we should confuse that right. that, 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 that uh, access to uh, the divine, to right. the muse, to inspiration, Shakespeare, uh, uh, to the objective mind shouldn't be confused with enlightenment because right, there's right. A, there's one area where there's intense productivity and work but there's also all sorts of the the full complement of demons that right. come from our yeah, friend the I, subjective mind the 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 dominating subjective mind mm-hmm. it's okay to have a subjective mind that's what's going to make us individuals if we survive into the future you'll still like a certain flavor of ice cream more than another You'll still have taste in art that that differs. It will be, in fact, completely unique to you, your individual taste. The only difference is you won't put value judgments on it. It won't mean anything that you like Van Gogh more than um, a nude Elvis painting. Uh, Elvis painting nude. Elvis nude on black velvet. That's the one we (laughs) like to pick on. (laughs) snobs that we are. That, you know, so yeah, so it, any of you out so, there with nude Elvises on black velvet, it's okay. It's okay. We've, it just shows it really how, isn't it okay. just shows how <laughs> screw, screwed up we are in our thinking. Take it from us. <laughs> We're you, are, you are not okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so how about this? Because you're, you're right. I mean, I was elevating those people, um, but I didn't feel like I was saying they're enlightened. But, you know, I think you're right to, to make sure, right. No. Because then, okay, let's take it. I mean, not that I've ever known anyone who is enlightened personally. Um, but from the things I've read about these people or heard other people ta- say about them, um, they seem to have a lot more energy than uh, ordinary people. And they don't, you know, like the story about Yogananda, I mean, about the how his body stayed, mm-hmm. you know. Letter of testi- testimony, a letter from Forest Lawn and, uh, funeral home mm-hmm. and cemeteries in uh, in Los Angeles. That, that it, his body was actually thirty days after his death. He had been embalmed or anything. They put him in a glass case because they were getting his ma- mausoleum ready, and uh, they said there was absolutely no smell. There was no sign of decay, and it was unprecedented in their experience that a human body, unfrozen, mm-hmm. could remain in that pristine condition. You know that that these people sleep less, eat need to eat less, and, and go what, ahead and say it. They ain't bored. Right. That what I'm saying is right. Exactly. That's and, enlightened. Right. An enlightened person wouldn't be bored. And what that means and, and what, why they don't need to eat so much, don't need to sleep so much, have more energy is because boredom is like blocking off the en- energy of the universe. You know, it, it's like I we're remember blocking that first time when I was from, seven years old. It was excruciatingly right, so, painful. Right. It's horrible. So, and like I said about it being a deadening thing, about it being ener- enervating and and sucking energy, and and you know that's how I was seeing more like it's it's like it's it's just it's like a you've taken gum and blocked up the works, so the flow of the energy you know that should be just flowing through us is is like blocked and stopped. It's and killing us. It's killing us. Yeah. And and someone who's enlightened is it's flowing. The, the gum has been removed. It, it's the flow is happening freely. So they're receiving the energy that is 
all, you know, that is the life force. Well, why don't we back it off enlightenment a little bit? Because <laughs> nobody around here knows what that is. <laughs> this is all I'll tell you this. <laughs> when I did this psychotropic substance called LSD-25, I'm tired of beating around the bush about it. Mm. It's not an endorsement. It's heavy-duty medicine. Um, it, for all intents and purposes, it was an enlightenment for me. For decades, I called it a religious experience, what had happened to me. And it was only in the last, within the last few years that I realized, no, it wasn't a religious experience at all. It was a state of being comparatively sane mm-hmm. for, the, for a few hours for so the first time in my adult adolescent life since I'm maybe a toddler, I had felt so liberated, so in love with the world, so appreciative and respectful of every moat of creation in front of me. I saw that it was perfect, it was good, and it was very good. Just the way it was, a burned down forest in Northern California in a rainy day in October, a cold, drizzly, rainy day. Not my, ex- my idea, ordinarily, of a pristine environment. And it was flawless. And that was my objective mind, freed of the cataracts of subjective opinion and belief and superstition and concept, apprehending correctly the perfection of objective reality. That's all it was. And that is available to us. That's in here, trapped. That line from The Panther by Rilke, Rilke, however you pronounce it, the German poet, Mm -hmm. you know, um, about a panther in the Paris Zoo. His sight from ever gazing through the bars has grown so dim that it sees nothing more. It seems to him that thousands of bars are before him and behind them nothing merely. The easy motion of a supple stride, which turns about the very smallest circle, is like a dance of strength about a center in which a mighty will stands stupefied. That mighty will is in all of us, in all things. It is the force that underlies everything. It's the truth. It is essence of sanity, of love, of peace, of strength, of certainty, of all the things that we really want. We don't want to win the lottery. We don't want to be on Dancing with Stars and win the big prize. That's not what we really want. What we really want is to remember who we are. We dance with the stars when we give up thinking we can find out who we are. Well, you know, I was thinking when you were saying we all dance that. dance with the stars. When, what? We, that's I mean, what we do. do the hoochie-coochie on the moon with the stars and the <laughs> no, constellations. When, when, when you've given up the, that there's any chance of knowing who you are, then you have to fill the boring days with something. Oh, and the way we the fill st- it is we dance with <laughs> the stars. <laughs> So okay, I'll I was go with that. fitting. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to get to my point and just trying to make this a quick aside on what you just go said. For it, honey. Because I just want to go with what you said, which is because I thought it fit perfectly with our theory of the universe that's laid out in, in our first book, The Game of God, which is the universe exists to experience limitation because if the, if the you know the one is unlimited. Uh, well, the only thing that you can't experience if you're unlimited is limitation. So in order to be truly unlimited, you also have to be able to experience limitation. That's right. Well, what's another word for, you know, being, you know, if you were a limited creature, boredom is an inherent part of that That's experience. Right. So the universe exists to experience boredom. Mm-hmm. We're, you know, we really are doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Talking about, I will scatter with lavish hand, to yeah. quote Walt Whitman. Right. That here you are surrounded, you know, it's like you're in the, you're in the Garden of Eden, you're in the Garden of kinetic magic, just ever-changing, incredibly intricate, fascinating, uh, trillion ring circus going yes. on every second and you're right. seeing 
I'm so bored, nothing man. To do. Like, nothing to do. <laughs> Guess I get drunk again. Because <laughs> they're drunk. There's a good way. Alcohol. This is interesting. <laughs> this is different. I feel weird and funny. You know. It's a way of getting through it. A way of getting through yeah, it. Yeah, that was somebody. Because um, the internet, you know, certainly opens up just incredible opportunities to fill any moment of boredom. But we we were looking at something about um, that people didn't really want to have t- televisions that were internet connected because when they sat down to watch television, they didn't want to be stimulated. They wanted passive entertainment that required nothing of them. They wanted to hook the umbilicals <laughs> up and just let it suck on them. Uh, right. Right. Which is how you feel after watching an evening of commercial. That's how I feel after an evening of commercial television. It's horrible. It's like I've been sucked on by a giant leech. But the interactive nature of the Internet. It's interesting. It's a phone call I had with a customer rep today, earlier today, said that he, his wife was really addicted to TV. As far as he was concerned, he could take it or leave it. And he said, I feel this, I'm starting to feel like when my computer dies, I'm going to get rid of it. I'm not going to get another one. He said, because I feel like. I could I could be doing so many other things than just sitting there on the internet. Mm-hmm. And it was like really helped me because I am I'm addicted, man. We have a big screen I and mean, we have a nine foot home theater screen. Yeah, surround system and I. It's like uh, you know every night, Josephine, it's movie night, and that's usually not up for debate unless I'm, something forces me at gunpoint to get out of the house and go do something. It's just like you know whether it's. Um, Art films or not, it, you know, it's like right. there's no discussion. I mean, I'm going to be parked in a Barca lounger before the mm-hmm. the big screen god. And right. um, and you you do use the internet and in kind of in that same passive way. I do. You're a consumer of. I am. And so you know, the internet definitely can go two ways. It can be as pass basically as passive as. As television, I'm not really. Wait a minute. Did I say they agree to something I don't agree with? Yes. I do a lot of shopping and business on the internet. Well, you do, but I mean, in terms better of. Better believe it. Yes. I'm a, I'm a kind of a news junkie ever since right. I became politicized after the 2000 recount, Pig Supreme Court decision. Um, I, um, I, you know, I'm, I, I do my share of political blogging, but, you know, I don't. <laughs> you know, you don't I thought post. about developing ass book instead of Facebook ass book. You was don't post be is what I'm saying. You read. You, oh, I do. I read. Oh, that's passive. what I mean. Oh, passive I see what in you that mean. way. Okay, good. You're not in, in. You're not interacting, which means you are contributing. Correct. In that sense, right? So, um, yeah, it's. I mean, certainly. I only associate with my peers. I associate with my peers or no one, and since I have no peers, I associate with <laughs> no one. Well, Ignatius so, Riley, A Confederacy of Dunces, killer book. And it, definitely, which should be, have been made into a movie by now, but Arthur would have been the perfect the person for the star. Do I believe what I am hearing? <laughs> he is, Egregious offense against good taste, geometry, right. and theology. That's right. He's, he's Ignatius come to life. Well, so and this boredom. is this uh, is where uh, you know Arthur and I have conflict. You know when you we talked about how you find me boring, and th- this is how I would say I find Arthur boring is is this worship of the television god. You know that it, it makes me crazy. I'm an extremist. I don't like I don't like pat easy answers. I don't like city parks. I like national parks where it's your right to be eaten by a grizzly bear, fall off a cliff, and be splattered all over the scenic viewpoint. I, 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 I don't like zoos. I hate zoos. They're concentration camps for animals where we go get our jollies by looking at something incarcerated in a cage. No, 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 no. no. I I, that's all like, fine and good. Yeah, but, but I just feel like the mundaneness of ordinary life, you know, we're only schedules. We got to write our book in the morning and then we work on our. But, video projects, but I'm talking and then about we do our kind of show every week, and then we run life. our errands, and we go to the store, and we buy our groceries, and everything is just regimented. And you know, when when it, when the sun goes down, it's time for to crank up the home theater. Talk about regimented. That's right. I mean, so what? So I mean, the rest of the damn day, you don't have any problem with that. We're making money. You have any problem with being regimented then? But when it's when the evening no. falls, and it's supposed to be. 
Now is free time. You know, when you go do your needlepoint, and I watch uh, well, Terminator 2 and Killer point. Surround. What no, is it? Not needlepoint. A, a needlepoint, whatever. What's the difference? Needlepoint, <laughs> so crocheting, about, though, is knitting. Weaving. <sighs> weaving. What's the difference? So um, I'm talking about stimulating the mind, though. And, and that, that <sighs> when I have my leisure time, I like my leisure time to be about stimulating the mind. That's good. That's you. And I'm 65 like, years old. Know, I've been pretty saying, stimulated in my lifetime, baby. Hey, hey, I'm just saying this is when I f- say earlier. Here come the fireworks. When I said earlier that I find things boring about you. Yeah. We talked about what you found boring about me. And, and so this is what I find boring about you good. is I feel like in your leisure time, you like to be dulled and lulled to sleep Mm -hmm. where in my leisure time i like to be stimulated Mm -hmm. and try new things yeah and i've I've seen you read countless books over the the last numbers of years and i regularly ask you you know this and i know this sounds uh somewhat arrogant but uh you know, we've written books on this subject, and we think we've cut deeper than anybody that I've read. And I keep asking you, uh, anything new there? Did you find anything that kind of scooped us, that uh, outdid us? And but the I, answer is no. But that doesn't mean I'm so not having So the answer is I'm s- saving myself a lot of time. By, um, <laughs> that's, but see, that's completely absurd. The, the court has passed judgment. <laughs> you know, been found, you've been tried by a jury of your peers, and... Found wanting. But you're, you, the, I did Look, say. Look, man, I like to do cocaine or I like to do LSD, you know, in Bora Bora and watch volcanoes erupt. You know, I either want to go whole hog or nothing. I'm not interested in sitting at home improving my mind with a book, which doesn't really need improving, by the way. I think the human race is tottering on the verge of oblivion by our own intransigent stupidity, intransigent stupidity such as watching Dances with Stars, you know? I don't watch Dancing with Stars. I don't watch commercial TV. If I really want, like, self-abuse, if I want something like a, a chili dog, I'll watch True TV for an evening, you know? I mean, I'm completely <laughs> honest about it. It's complete mind rot, you know, watching poor people get uh, abused. I'll watch cops. Otherwise, I'll watch something that's, that's got some um, artistic merit. Oh, I'm, and I'm bored because, oh, man, God, what am I doing in Dixieland? But I don't even know if it's Dixieland anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm such a freak now. I've gone so far. Yeah. I've just gone so far past human relationship. Mm-hmm. I'd rather die in a ditch than spend an evening talking small talk with people. You come to our house, you're going to get the truth rammed in your face. Or, the, or shown nothing. the door. Or shown the door, and you won't be asked back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm 65 years old. I don't even have to apologize. I'm I'm bored with boring people. I don't care how you're doing. I don't care about your Aunt Emma's hysterectomy. I couldn't care less. <laughs> it's her problem. <laughs> how am I doing? Yeah. You know, I, I, see, there. Well, the, but you know, I we're think writing there's... a book that actually posits the human race is operationally insane. Hello. Woo. You know what that means? That means we're all crazy, and we have hydrogen bombs. We watched a documentary I highly recommend. It's called Countdown to Zero. If that doesn't scare you, you need to change your medications. Really, first five minutes, I was afraid, very afraid. We had 60,000 nuclear devices, nuclear weapons on this planet. Not so long ago. It's down to 20,000 now. But the American Nazi Party, also known as the GOP, is uh, blackmailing President Yomama, uh, who's about as ineffectual as a dead ant, as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, 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 the START Treaty. I mean, just, you know, the next step. Start start new. Start two. Who cares? I mean, come to uh, come to grips with it. Their latest blackmail for the rich. You people are so dumb. I mean, I'm sorry. I can't respect you for being stupid enough to vote for the Republican Party. I'll only respect you if you make over $500,000 a year. Well, you know what? I'll even make it two hundred and fifty thousand. I'll respect you if you vote for the Republican Party and you bring home two hundred and fifty thousand. You net two fifty thousand a year. Otherwise, I think you're incredibly stupid. I mean, in an almost organic way. So, how can anybody be that misinformed? I mean, you really need to turn off Fox News and Rush Limbaugh and Glenn Beck and get a life. Check out some other. You know, call us and I'll, I'll suggest some sites for you to go to where you'll get not just 
Keith Olbermann, Rachel Maddow clown show, but some some hard facts and statistics. I mean, and, and don't get me wrong, the demon crats, you know, or the, the the flip side of real ugly man party, a real ugly man party. Um, I didn't mean to get political, but this yeah. is another state of incredible boring. I bored up. I have grown up with rednecks. I grew up in the South. You people never change. You really don't change. Of course, that's what a conservative is, is someone who is uh, completely organically opposed to change. Well, I think uh, this is when you talk about why you're bored. Uh, you know, I think what am I doing kind of, in Dixie land? This. That's a good question. But you also said, I mean, God. it's like the whole human race is insane. And, you know, it, it just it, it becomes increasingly difficult to find any way, any way that you can look and see something interesting and exciting going on on the planet because it's just everybody's. Are we ready for President Palin? <laughs> Why not? You worship celebrities and money. Your lost, godless, soulless mediocrities, you know, who live vicariously through rich people or something or glitzy, you know, you listen to bubblegum music, synthetic trash. Right. How much of, like we just, we God, watched Fantasia. Dull can you get? We watched Fantasia, and which, you know, we were just astonished to see that that was made in 1940. You know, what an incredibly innovative use of of this new technology of sound recording on film. And, um, and, and maybe that's just like so much of what our society has done, has, which has monetized everything. So the, monetized? Yeah, made it about money. So oh, monitor, monitor, monetarized. Monetarized, I got So, it. you know, and that's what you were just saying about, every, you know, music is completely corporate controlled. So what gets onto the airwaves is things that have been programmed correctly to sell. And so the, the real creativity is being stifled under this money-driven society that we're in. Right. And, and, you it's know, all that, we're taught that, is worship the damn that creati- dollar. That creativity that I saw there in Fantasia, I was like, where, where is that level of creativity? Of- all drawn, every single frame drawn by hand, yeah. every single. That, you know, I thought about what, what a gift this was to just legions of people who had been afraid of classical music their whole life. And now with all your hard. sophisticated, state-of-the-art, computer-generated uh, graphics, and it's so devoid of any innocence and wonder. It's right. all smirking, cynical, tough guy, smart ass talking. That's what you're pumping your kids full of. Anyway, you know what? I really wanted to say this. Yeah. It's perfect. <laughs> it really is perfect. Yeah, that's right. You said that It sounds earlier. like this show sounds like <laughs> bitchathon. You know, complain o rama. That's what this show is. A question of bitching about everything. <laughs> I don't we think bitch you can about say things. That. We bitch because we think we're for the first time in human history we're on the edge. This is no joke. Since the advent of the hydrogen bomb and the all these uh, industrial technological revolutions, the environmental impact. Sorry, rednecks, you're on the wrong side there too. Just like you were <laughs> on the environment, like you were on uh, on, on integration, like you were on so many things. You're just wrong. But you know what? True progressives, thinkers. People of the mind, we just have to drag you along. You're just the baggage. You know, you have to be lugged along by the ears into the 21st century if you don't blow us up first with your, you're so enamored of people like Glenn Beck and Rush Limbaugh and you really think those people know what they're talking about that you are going to go down, you know, electing people like John Boner and, you know, Bitch McConnell and other Neanderthals. Uh, anyway, so we're, we're but the, the, reason, the point is, right. the point is, the point is that in spite of all our complaining and whining, because we think the insane asylum is really on fire, and we, the inmates, are in real peril. This is all perfect. This is the drama Katie described of evolution. Mm-hmm. Sorry for those of you who don't believe in evolution. <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> Um, this is the panorama of life on this little planet unfolding, and we may well not make it. And the point that I really want to make is, and I know this when I have glimmering moments of something like sanity, and a glimmering moment now would say, we are all literally doing the best we can. I don't know Rush Limbaugh. 
but I know he's doing the best he can. Even if, mm-hmm. even if he knows that he's a fraud and even if he knows he's a hate monger, maybe he doesn't. Maybe he really believes that stuff. I don't think so, but let's assume he does. Mm-hmm. That makes him even more deserving of compassion because he's crazy. We're all doing the best we are capable of. The, the, the love that I feel for you right now, disembodied soul out there in cyberspace, or the love I feel for Katie right now, that's what I'm up to. That's the best I'm capable of right now. And it ain't much. I've experienced much more. But it's, it's where, I'm, where I am right now, and it's where we are as the people on this planet. I'm not just picking on the United States. It's a global insane asylum. That's what we think. We're all in a state of real confusion that what makes us craziest is we thinking we know when we really don't know. That's the truth. We don't know. But we act like we know it all, and that's what's getting us into right, so dangerous waters. The reason we're always complaining about stuff is is because we're we have the hope and the vision for a better and different future. Um, that's, you know, we, we say, here are the problems of today because we think we can be better. I'm reading one of the useless books I'm reading currently is about capitalism, the history of capitalism written by a liberal historian. And one of the things she says is that progress, the idea of progress did not exist until about 200 years ago, they, they had the word progress, but it meant like you walked down the road, you progressed down the road. <laughs> that was the only meaning of that word. Interesting. Um, There's something interesting. And that um, because tradition, people, uh, the way people lived did not change over centuries and millennia. I mean, there's a very, 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 very slow change that people could not see in their own lives. So there was no concept of anything ever changing. It, everything, it's always been this way. It always will be this way. And it was only at the advent of the Industrial Revolution, you know, around that time, that things started changing fast enough in a single person's lifetime that there was the concept of progress, of things actually getting better. And um, or changing, I should say, progress. <laughs> Just because it's Dare changed doesn't word, mean worse. Hope. But so I mean, this is when you think of it, it was kind of wow. Progress is actually a new concept in human thinking, and um, so I think there can be the conservative. There's and the conservatives still have that position of holding things the way they are. And if you're complaining, love it or leave it. If you're complaining, that means. You know, you you know, you hate this the way things are. It's a bad thing to complain. But you know, for us, for me, for sure, complaining comes from the desire to make better, the the belief that things could be better. And I dislike the word complaining. I use that, yeah. but it's it's really critiquing. Critiquing. That's right. It's also bitching. <laughs> it's pointing sometimes, out the negative. Sometimes it's bitching. That's that's. But oftentimes it's critiquing. Yes. Look at our country. Look at the United that's States. Right. Look at that clown show going on in Washington. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the you, rich are in control. You don't think Does we anybody can do really doubt that? You don't think we can do better? <laughs> Please. We need a clean house, but you know what? Yeah. A revolution from our point of trifling ignorance isn't going to change anything. She's going to buy a little more time till, till another bunch of certified swine gain control again, get their pig trotters corrupted. The whole Our government is corrupt. We need to get money, just for starters, get money away from Washington. D. We right. should move the capital to an underground <laughs> bunker at an undisclosed location. And anybody who wags a dollar bill at a any elected official should be shot on spot, on the spot. Mm. I'm not advocating violence. Sounds like it, doesn't it? Anyway. My, my uh, bestial side advocates violence and everything else. Well, considering kept, this is a uh, show on yeah. boredom, it's been a pretty interesting yeah, one. Yeah, hopefully it wasn't boring for you. I'm slightly less <laughs> bored than I was when it started. Only <laughs> slightly. Well, since if boredom is our, uh, you know, um, ordinary state of consciousness, then it's okay if you're still somewhat That's bored. Good. Well, think about that. Think about it. So long, folks. Thanks for tuning in. See you again.